I'm just going to introduce Sarah Cogan, and she explores themes of biographical narrative, landscape and memory. Sarah is the artist behind the Changing the Landscape exhibition, which is our first exhibition held at the, the National Archives, our first art exhibition. Changing the Landscape, it's focused on the Battle of the Somme, and it's a visual arts project which is supported by the National Lottery through the Arts Council of England. And it's a really exciting exhibition because it mixes together the personal, very intensely personal, but also sets it in that First World War landscape. In addition to all of that, Sarah is also a lecturer with Bethlehem Royal Hospital and South London and Morsley NHS Foundation Trust, and she also contributes to an exciting and vast range of different magazines and websites looking particularly around First World War and history. I just wanted to give people a sense of where your art comes from, and particularly the thing which I'm interested in is that it seems to always come from narrative, which feels to me unusual for a visual artist. Is it unusual? And am I right that it comes from narrative? I don't think it's unusual that narrative, that visual art uses narrative, or that might be a starting point. But I think all my work has always started off with stories. And there might be, I don't know, we could sort of explore why, why that might be. I think particularly coming from a sort of uh, family which is descended from immigrants, I think there were always stories and things that we didn't know about my family. And I think perhaps for me, discovering narrative and what's behind things is very important. And this particular change the landscape, this particular narrative is focused in on your great uncle, great uncle Barney. Uh, yep. When did you first hear of him? Do you remember that? Well, I remember as a very small child going to my grandmother Fanny's house and she used to show me a series of letters and drawings, particularly the drawings. She didn't really used to read me the letters, which had been sent home by her brother, who I knew had died in the First World War. I mean, to be honest, I didn't know very much else about him. But he'd done these very beautiful little drawings. And um, he was always called Uncle Barney as if he was still around, which was quite odd, really, um, thinking back on it. So he felt like he was a family member who had somehow disappeared, but I wasn't really quite sure about the circumstances. And did you have an impression of him? Was there, was there kind of a family story around Uncle Barney? The only impression I had was I knew that he'd been very loved and that she'd never really got over his dying um, and that he could draw... And in my family, on that side of the family, people were very proud of being able to draw for some reason, I think because they'd been furniture makers and he'd been a furniture maker. Uh, one of the things which really appeals to me and really stands out to me about changing the landscape is it pushes against that cultural memory, which I at least have imbibed, I don't know if anyone else has, the idea that the First World War is about um, posh, blonde, aristocratic blokes going off and dying <laughs> in the trenches, and, that, and that's not who Barney is. Well, it's in no sense what he is. It isn't what his life was like, and culturally it's not what he was like at all. I mean, he, he was born to a Lithuanian Jewish mother and a Russian Jewish father who had um, fled from Eastern Europe from the pogroms um, at the latter end of the 19th century. And um, they were a secular family, not religious in any sense, in fact, quite anti-religion, but they were very much a Jewish family, and he grew up in the East End in a terrace house with nine brothers and sisters, two of whom died in the diphtheria epidemic. Um, and um, when, he, when he finally went off to war, he was put into... I mean, I was quite shocked when I found this out, but in fact his regiment, the London Rifle Brigade, who were from Hackney, were mainly made up of a Jewish uh, con conscripts or volunteers. In his case, he volunteered. Um, they were put into a trench called Yiddish Street Trench, which was named by the, by the British Army. Um, and subsequently were then uh, used to draw the German fire while there was a counter-attack from another regiment. So his identity of being Jewish really carried through right mm -hmm. until his, his death. Um, however, I think, like with many Jewish families, he, he, they very much wanted to assimilate and be part of the British society. And I, I, I wonder what his parents would have felt about this, about their son going off to France. They would never have been to France. They had come from another bit of Europe. To Britain, and I do think I wonder what that felt like to them. And also, I think maybe there was a sense of wanting to um, enforce the idea that they were British, and maybe the sacrifice of a child to the army was one way that you could do that and be part of general society. Was he the only one of his siblings who died? Yes, apart from two in the diphtheria epidemic, he was the only one who went to, to war right. and died. 
so we're going to move to talking a bit more about the original material, which which the, the work comes from in a minute. But before that, I just wanted to. I'm really interested in in your terminology, which you use, because you always talk about Barney's archive, and you term it an archive. Now, archive is a word that I really like um, working here, <laughs> but I'm interested in, in why you chose that word, and what that word does for you. I I think there was a process. I mean, when I first Obviously, after I'd seen the letters at my grandmother's house and the drawings, I thought they'd been given away to, actually to the Imperial War Museum. When I finally saw them again a few years ago, really not that long ago, uh, five years ago, um, and my, my mother had them on, in a box on the shelf, like I guess that happens in many families, um, I looked inside this box and thought there were probably about 30 letters and photographs and photographic postcards. And when I laid them out, which I did on my living room car carpet in a chronological order, I suddenly realised that they were nearer 180 and that they'd only been written over five months. And at that point, they were no longer little bits of paper with perished rubber bands, which my grandmother had, had wrapped up and put in a box. They suddenly became an archive. And, and I think I started thinking of it like that. And then once I brought it here to see see an expert here, I suppose that reinforced that. And what you have of Barney, is it from the war? Do you have things of his from outside that time? I have a few bits uh, which are things like his uh, school certificates. He did very well at school in Hackney. He was, and so I have a few bits about that. But no, I don't actually, I don't have any of his belongings. I don't know where they are or what happened to That's them. interesting in the sense that it was that was the important stuff, known even at the time, that that was the stuff to keep. Well, he wrote, if you have a look at the exhibition in one of the boxes, there's lots of um, letters and photographs of soldiers. And in between, what I've done is I've used the photographs to highlight or mask out bits of letters. And the bits that are left continually say, I'm sending home photos, I'm sending home letters, collect them up. And he wrote to my grandmother specifically and said, can you go round to everybody and collect everything up? So, because he had this sense of legacy and history, he knew, even as a 20-year-old, that it was going to be really important one day, and he wanted to see it when he came home. Now, of course, he never did that, but I, I almost felt he was talking directly to me when he says, you know, one day these might be interesting. And was that immediate? <laughs> when you saw this box, you went, this is going to be related to my art, this is, this is going to provoke something. Well, I remember because I'd done all these, as I, as I showed you one of the paintings, I'd been doing those sorts of paintings which were about aerial views of landscape. And that had turned into, but through an interest in aerial photography, it had turned into uh, paintings about battlefields. And so that's what I was thinking about. And at some point, and then First World War battlefields, and then at some point I remember these letters. So you were doing the... You were interested in the First World War before the letters? Sorry, yes, yes. That's goes really as well. interesting. So for about ten years before, I'd been doing these paintings all about the First World War, but I, I hadn't made any connection with the letters. And at some point, after about 10 years, after exhibiting lots of paintings and them being collected and stuff, I, I, I remembered the letters. And I remember opening them up, like I said, and laying them out of the carpet, which I made a film piece about, which is in the exhibition called Carpet Piece, on a very cold winter's day. And I remember thinking, well, this is really odd because they begin in February 1916 and they end on the 29th of June and that's the day before the Battle of the Somme. I didn't know at that point he'd been in the Somme. Mm. And at some point I thought, oh no, I'm going to have to do something with them. It's just too important and massive and I'm an a abstract painter and what am I going to do with all this text and somebody else's drawings and thinking... I don't really know how I'll see my way through that. But you knew you had to. There was absolutely no doubt in my mind that they, that they were going to be really, really important really early on in looking at them. And I'm really interested in the fact that you looked at it and thought, what am I going to do with all that text? And actually what you did is come here, where there's quite a lot more text. Yes. That, that doesn't feel... Was that a, a natural journey for you to come to another, more official, potentially, archive? Well, one of the things... When I looked at them, was I thought, OK, now I need to know, are they unusual or does everybody have a box like this? Is there anything in them that would make them really... I mean, they're going to be really amazing to me. They're going to be extraordinary. They're about my family. They seem pretty extraordinary. He wrote three times a day, most days, for five months, if not more. There's loads of photographs and drawings and photographic postcards, but will anybody else think they're interesting? Because I knew nothing about archives mm. at all. And so I needed to go somewhere where someone could say, 
yes, everyone else has got a box like this, they're interesting but only to you, or no, they are actually of any importance. That seems important to know. Yeah, and how did that, did you come here with them or did you... Yes, I got in touch with William Spencer, who's the principal military specialist here, and um, I made an appointment. And what was amazing about that was I, walk, I remember walking in with this box and sitting down, and William came out with lots of photocopies that he'd made of my paintings, which he'd found on the internet. And he sat down and said, I totally can see where you're coming from, because he'd been a soldier with your, your battlefields. And we had a very long conversation mm. about that before we moved on to the archive. And then I remember I said to him, um, OK, I want to follow. What I want to do now is I want to go and get funding, and I want to follow on his journey back to France, and I want to go to everywhere on the postcards and find out where he was. How close do you think you can get me to where he stood in France? And he said, a metre. And that really was quite shocking to me. I thought, well, how could he possibly do that? And of course, with the amazing records that are here and his help, within, you know, a year or so, I was standing in the field where Barney's body still still lies because he was missing, and um, I had a mobile phone in one hand of the trench map, map system, a sort of photograph on it, and in the other I had an overhead photograph of, of the present day, and I could work out exactly what he'd been doing, where he'd been scouting, where he'd been, and almost exactly where his body probably is as well. So that was really extraordinary. That is really extraordinary. And what was... Because what was that moment like? Because sometimes those moments when you think, I'm on a battlefield, this should feel immense, it should feel epic, don't, because it's a field. Well, it was a very mundane, very modern day field. And walking, I mean, it, it obviously was amazing to be there and to be able to see Zed Hedge, which I knew he'd been making trench maps around um, and I could see all of that in the middle of a cabbage field where that would be because I had this, this way of doing that. So it was really kind of living history. However, you looked up and there was a metal barn and a tractor and there was no beauty and there was no history. There wasn't a big sign saying the, the picturesque view of the battle of the, you mm -hmm. know, it wasn't like that. And what happened after a while, we went there once um, and my partner, Jeremy who's sitting over there, he was filming for the exhibition at the same time. And I began to think, well, hang on a minute, where is the history? I'm going to have to work a bit harder to find the history because actually history isn't really in this field. When you look at it, the history is sort of in me. I'm bringing the history with me. Mm. And so for the next trip, when we went the next year, I, um, I started to make paintings of Barney and I thought I would take his um, photographs and I started to take things and lay them in the field where he... I thought he was. And then things started, the, the second trip, I remember there was a bit of fencing that I recognised from the Goncourt panoramic photograph, which I, is exhibited with my work, um, next door. A piece of that fence was just lying on the grounds. But it was this whole idea about how you find history and how it becomes resonant for you. Mm. We're going to hear some of the letters now that, that Barney sent home. Sarah, can you just tell us a bit about what we're going to hear? Yeah. Um, if you haven't been to the exhibition, there is a very long 2.8 metre panoramic view which was taken in the trench on the 20th of May 1916 on the day that my great uncle's regiment arrived in the Yiddish Street Trench in order to fight. What's amazing about that view is the photographer is inside the trench looking out over the field where Barney's body still, still is now. It's where he fought, it's where he, he was spying and making trench maps. And um, what I find really amazing is the letters, we're going to hear three letters which were, which were um, written on the 22nd and the 23rd of May from that very trench. Two are to his brother, Isaac, who's I, dear I, and the other one is to his parents. Thanks, Owen. The Firing Line, France, May 22nd, 1916. Dear I, just received your letter, hence this answer. Am, um, as above isn't all honey, dodging big shells, etc. My pal, Middleton, sitting between Sam and myself, was hit by a high explosive in the head, and I hear he has died since, RIP. We were very friendly, having a great interest in common in sketching. We can't tell why we were not hit as well, as according to rules, about 10 of us should have been hit. I can't tell you where I am. I am really enjoying the experience of hearing bullets whiz by, now it's a screech or whine of a shell, then a burst. 
I have had the unique, to me, experience of going beyond the frontline trench for some distance past our wire. How and why, I also must not tell. Please don't let them know at home where I am if you think they will take it badly. We cannot buy any grub here and my Tommy's cooker has run out. I know you don't mind my asking this to be remedied. We'll write soon, as soon as I am settled. I have a lovely billet. Give my love to all at home. I won't forget your advice and remember, there ain't no flies on yours. Affectionately, Barney. Scouting like mad, France, May 23rd, 1916. Dear I, here I am again mucking about in, behind, in front of, and in fact, all around the front line trenches. Quite exciting. It's a funny feeling to be shot at, still funnier to hear the whine or hum of bullets and shells of many descriptions overhead. As to letting them know at home, I think I will, let them, I will tell them how things are and have been when we go down to rest. It's best they should know from me, for I think they are bound to hear from other sources and they shall put no faith in my letters. Don't you think so? Probably Arthur or Mick has written home and then there are other sources. In the meantime, you can use your tact and hint at my position and see how they take it. I expect it will be all right. I've just seen Arthur. He looks fit and well. He has been on fatigues up the front line. Mick also looks well and cheerful. Sam is A1, myself likewise. So everything in the garden is lovely. Well, look out for my long letter. I'm about to commence. So, with love to all, I am, yours affectionately, Barney. May 23rd, 1916, BEF, France. Dear parents, just a line to let you know that I am having a great time. <laughs> the weather is terribly hot and we have had some, march, some hard marches that have made us hotter still, but we know how to look after ourselves. We can hear the guns quite plainly from where we are, able to see the flashes, etc., of starlights. I'm writing a long green envelope letter with all the news. This is only a formal letter to let you know all is well. We have got a fine billet, about 16 of us in a room that has even got pictures on the wall. Unforgivable extravagance in wartime. Well, I will close now. With love to all from both Sam and myself, I am your loving son, Barney. P.S. Don't worry if I don't write so frequent. We can't post letters on the move. Okay. Um, so as you can see, that those were written within a 24 hour period from the trench that's in that, in that panoramic photograph. But I think I just find it very interesting that you get this multiple view. So when he writes to his brother, although he, he's saying he's okay, he also talks about someone's head being blown off and man manoeuvring in front of and behind the trench. And then when he comes to his parents, there's obviously, he's trying to shield them all the time. And because of that, one of the, one of the questions that William helped answer when I sort of said to him, is this unusual, this kind of archive? Apparently what's really unusual about it is this multiple view that goes on all the way through the five months. So you get this layering. And within that process, you get to see a lot about what Barney was feeling and thinking. And also what was very unusual was that he was a private, he was a working class private from Hackney, a furniture maker from Hoxton Square who became a map maker. And they weren't allowed to keep private diaries. And although you get lots of officers who write in diaries about what was really going on, because Barney does this multiple layering thing, we get to see things that are very unusual for a private to have written. And do you think we see the real Barney? Because he's so good at filtering that and knowing what to say do you think he's hiding stuff always I that's think, hard to answer of course I but. think he compartmentalises what's happening to him all the time and I see it as a bit like, they're a bit like tweets in a way his letters you get one view then you get another view then you, and all the time he's saying I'm here I'm still alive don't forget me why aren't you writing more I mean, at the end he's really quite desperately asking for letters from home and so I thought a lot about whether I feel I know him, because I know where he ate his lunch, I know what he was doing, I know what he wrote, I know some of what he thought. But I think I've come to the conclusion at the end that you can't really reach through history to somebody that clearly and feel like you really knew them as a person. He still is, I mean, we see him through the lens of history. We know what's going to happen to him. Yeah. We know that at the end, he dies on the battle, first day of the Battle of the Somme. That's, that's a given. So in a sense, I don't think he's hiding who he is, but I think he's... 
he's so caught up in this bigger narrative. I I think, I think yes, and I think his worry where he is showing these multiple views really gives away who he is in a sense. You mm. see his dilemma, there's a real 20-year-old dilemma about what, it seems to be most of his waking hours seem to be worried about what people think at home and how he's going to tell them yeah. for many months. Because he thought he was going back to them. But yes, he just didn't want his mother to know he was in danger. And that's, yeah. I think, was what, why people didn't write the truth home. And I'm really fascinated by the role of your grandma in all of this. So how old was she when Barney was writing home? She was a teenager. She was a bit younger um, because there'd been two, the two children who died in their family were between him and, and her. And so her, her role, um, because he writes a whole load of letters to her and loads and loads of postcards get sent to her. Almost all the visual images get sent to her, including pictures of hats when at the very end he's about to die in the Battle of the Somme. He starts sending pictures of hats, which I find really quite extraordinary, very frivolous images. Mm. And I think her role is to keep everything together. He talks a lot about Hackney and the business, and she had to take over his role in the business when he died and sit on the canal right by where my studio is um, to get the, the, the wood in off the, off the boats and the rats used so to run over her. So that was an agreed role, that she would keep it? She, she was the designated keeper? Yeah. Custodian? Yeah. And of anything, anything else about the war he wanted to say, anyone he met, from, he met loads of people from Hackney, from his street, or from, he talks continually, he's very rude about them. He meets <laughs> someone he calls the hokey pokey merchant's boy from down the road, and he's very sort of irreverent about them. But, but one of the things, talking about the canal, one of the things that came out that was really amazing to me were the amount of coincidences that, when I opened these letters, that, that I discovered. So. While I've been crawling all over these battlefields, because I always paint flat on, on the floor of my studio rather than the wall, because of the way my technical process means I have to keep the paint flat. Um, so I've been crawling over these battlefields, and when I opened the letters and read them, I didn't know that Barney was a map maker. So of course, he'd been crawling all over this landscape as well, which is, is the reason why, when you go and see the exhibition, everything is flat in boxes, because I want the audience also to replicate that concept of looking over material. Um, because that's a real resonant theme throughout the whole thing. I also didn't know that I'd been working in a studio that was built in a First World War tent factory and that he'd probably slept in a tent which was built in the space I'd been in for 25 years. And I also didn't know that he'd worked around the corner in Hoxton Square. I thought they'd lived slightly further north and work, worked somewhere else. So there are all these amazing coincidences yeah. that gave me this very strong emotional connection to him and, with and the family. And the threads that you're talking about, are, uh, I'm particularly interested by artistic works which, which are in that space between evidence and history and fact and memory yeah. and, and how people navigate that. And that's where I would say your work is. It's in that, that space, that kind of liminal space between, yeah. between what we know and what we can prove, whether it's in Barney's letters or whether it's looking at maps and, and trenches. And that family story and also the stories about the First World War, which we all have as our folk memories and sure. all of those things. And how do you find a voice amidst all of those different competing threads? Well, as I said, when I first you know, looked at the letters properly as an adult rather than a five-year-old, um, I came to it as an abstract, from an abstract painter's point of view. Okay, interested in narrative, but what was I going to do? And I, it took me a long time. I had to re, re, I had to read them and read them really to absorb them all. And then I had to come here and read everything I could about, you know, because there's a parallel story here, which is the military point of view, which talks about all exactly the same days and places that Barney does in his letters. So I could undo all his backstory and find out exactly what had happened to him. And then there was my journey as well this century looking back and going back to France and going back through the letters and I kept thinking but what am I going to do with it all am I going to make paintings will it be big paintings and then I could publish his archive as one thing and I decided not to do any of that and it was a bit dangerous in some ways or risky because I decided to just let all those threads run at the same time in some kind of spider's web that was in my head and I began by by, because for me it has to be about something visual and it has to be actual. There has to be a bit of paper that you do something with or a canvas you do something with, you make something with. And on the wall of my studio I built up a sketchbook which was made up of all different images and connections. And I kept thinking it's a spider's web and somewhere Barney's in the middle and I'll just let it all 
run through and I'll trust the audience to find a route through that. So there is a chronology, which is Barney's chronology. But I haven't necessarily laid it out in chronological order even because, I want, because the visuals for me are more important actually and the visceral sort of evocative mm. elements. And I think in between those spaces, I'm hoping all those things you mentioned, memory, folklore, history, that you as an audience will be able to find your way through that and get that. I think it's interesting because as in this archive, we order things. Quite often, actually, we try and keep original order on things, so not change the order they came in. Oh, right, that's um, interesting. That's yeah. one of the big archival concepts, is that you try and keep things as you find them. Yeah, but yeah. there is also an order. Everything's catalogued, everything's thought about, everything's in place. And dates matter a lot in that. And you've kind of stepped slightly yes. outside of that. For me, it's the concept that's important. It's an yeah. art project. I don't have labelling in there. You have to go and get a little book and find out. I've written everything down, but you have to go and discover that because what I want you to do is kind of sail through it in your own space, finding your own way through. Mm. In, but looking down on everything, that's the concept. And also step back and looking at the boxes. And to me, they're very like coffins the boxes that the works in the display tables and they're also like markers in the cemetery so there's a much bigger concept as well that hopefully pulls it all together. There's something just kind of gut-wrenchingly awful about the core of this story. A, a really, from his letters, a really lovely young man who mm. died. And does being an artist, seeing it through that artistic lens, make it easier for you to detach from that or is that actually the centre of it for you as well? Underneath it all, what I wanted was, I, didn't, I, I felt with the First World War in particular, we were so used to seeing certain images over and over again that we'd become almost a bit immune. And I just wanted to focus in on faces and personal elements and one line that just suddenly makes you click into, oh God, it did actually happen to somebody like me and be able to relate to it. So what is next for you? Have you got... Have you got plans? Well, Changing the Landscape will continue. It, in um, September, it goes on to the London School of Economics. It's going to be there, and I'm hoping to tour it maybe abroad. That would be something I'd really like to do, to take it either to France or Germany or maybe somewhere else. Um, and I definitely would like to work with archives again. I am missing doing some painting. Painting is at the core of everything for me, so I will be going back to that. But I, I really like... I think I've really found a way that fits every bit of what I want to do. So text doesn't worry you anymore? No, not at all. <laughs> and um, I think I'd really like to carry on working in a similar way. <laughs>